Hi, John. Hi, Rosemary. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing. I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Yeah. Sorry about my lack of grammar there. <laughs> okay. That is a wonderful orange colour. You said it would be, you had this lovely orange in your clinic, and it is actually, isn't it? <laughs> Charlotte, okay. Charlotte's locks. Lovely. Um, so, welcome back, everybody. We are very fortunate now to have John. I'm sure John wouldn't mind me calling him a veteran massage. <laughs> Um, John is, as you, you probably know, the, event, the, the inventor of the hydrotherm system. He's got over, what, 50,000 hours under his hands. Um, he's a lecturer in applied anatomy and clinic and spa massage. He runs one of the UK's most successful specialist massage therapy clinics, and he's director of massage training at the massage company. And Today, um, John is very much here to talk about becoming an expert and to inspire you in your vision forward. And definitely from Dave and from what Tracy is saying later, that this kind of expert and specialist is absolutely crucial to thrive. Okay. So, John, I am going to hand over to you there we go that's a little bit more of john's credentials as well you'll notice actually in the center we've got the satcc which is the really new standards authority for touching cancer care that is becoming more and more well known for people for setting um, the standards around working with people in cancer it's going to become something very important going forward and support very very many people so John over to you okay thanks very much Rosemary Pleasure. Uh, well hello um, I'm going to be sharing some insights about the financial and emotional benefits of being an expert in massage therapy now I can do this in two ways I can do a very serious presentation and provide you with lots of facts and figures uh, mostly correct, but on the whole, pretty boring. Or I could do this in the way that I actually became an expert. And that was not to take myself too seriously, to have a laugh, and to completely love every moment of what I do. For those of you expecting the first presentation, goodbye. I hope we meet again at some point in the future. Overall, experts in every trade or profession make more money. In medicine, consultants make more than doctors. In law, barristers make more than lawyers. And in life, plumbers make more than consultants and barristers put together, and they use nothing more than a monkey wrench to do so. My apologies to all the plumbers out there, but I just wanted to check to see if anyone was listening. Let me begin with sharing just a few things about my journey towards becoming an expert just so I can give you some context. My upbringing and childhood were terrible. My father was a gambler. He was born, lived and died angry. The best thing that my mum ever did was to put all of my belongings into two Tesco carrier bags and tell me not to come back. I was 17 years old at the time, homeless and broke. Clearly, I did not come from a privileged background. I left school at 16 with no qualifications. I have a family tree that is more like a bramble bush than any tree. I have made more mistakes than I can count. I got loads of things wrong. I failed to listen and I paid the price. And none of these things stopped me from becoming an expert. And if it did not stop me, then why would it stop you? My mum and I still laugh about the day that she threw me out. She's 91 now. It was the toughest and the smartest thing she ever did for me. And that was to get me away from my father. When I made a mistake, I learned from it. When I got things wrong, I got it right next time. Well, in truth, probably the time after that, actually. When I failed to listen, I paid the price. I began to listen more and speak less. 
One of the most important things that you will need to become an expert is determination. You have really got to want to do it. The second is a genuine interest in the pursuit of knowledge in the area that you wish to become an expert in. And for me, that was massage. I remember making a terrible mistake in my early career by repeating something that I had been taught. At the time, I was under the misguided belief that I would enhance my credibility if I could get referrals from a doctor. And in my case, this was a man called Dr. Jan Kamali. Jan had booked in for a massage and I was out to impress. I was both excited and nervous to treat Dr. Kamali. He had booked in for a back massage, so I had half an hour to impress him. I used all of the techniques that I could muster. Now, for those of you that do not know me personally, I'm six foot two tall, I weigh 15 stone, and I have hands like shovels. I am built for massage. When I reach the shoulders of my prized client, I, I managed to find those famous knots that so many people seem to have. No problem, I thought. I will just use my elbows to get rid of them. I went on to explain to Jan, this was probably a buildup of lactic acid from the work in the gym and that I could almost certainly help. I was positive that I was reciting knowledge that I had learned and that it was correct. I set about him with a degree of gusto. When we had finished and he had sat up, I could see that he was a little disappointed. And this is what he said. John, you have great hands, but you really do need to have a better understanding of your anatomy and physiology. Those knots in my shoulders that you referred to and then tried to get rid of are just two tendons of two muscles that are supposed to be there. He paid and thanked me for his, uh, for his massage. My world had just collapsed. I was both disappointed and distressed that I had spoken complete nonsense to my prized customer. And I had almost certainly made a fool of myself by repeating something that I had been told. It was at this point that I learned one of the most valuable lessons about becoming an expert. And it is this. Don't believe anything that people tell you about massage until you have properly checked it out for yourself. And that includes me. That single piece of information will send you far down the road to becoming an expert. It did me because from that day to this, I have listened to all sorts of supposed facts and claims about massage, anatomy and physiology. I listen to them all and then I do my research to see if they can be substantiated. I subsequently learned that my claims during treatment about lactic acid were also nonsense but that can be the subject of a discussion on another day. You might be interested to know that Jan became a friend and a colleague, and I still treat him today, almost 30 years later, albeit that my anatomy knowledge is now considerably improved. As always, when I tried to follow my own advice, I learned another valuable lesson. After my early bruising encounter with Jan, I decided that I really needed to understand my anatomy. And being a proper boy and living near the University City of Oxford, I decided to buy a proper book on anatomy. So I visited a very famous bookshop called Blackwell's and I bought the most expensive book on anatomy and physiology I could find. It was called Anatomy and Physiology by Solomon Schmidt and a Dragner. It was so expensive, it was wrapped in cellophane to stop people seeing inside it. I bought the book and I was excited to take a look inside. I carefully removed the cellophane and opened the first page and I read the first six words that I could see highlighted and they were these. Eponymous terms are cited in parentheses. That's not a great start, I thought. I've just read the first six words in the most expensive book that I have ever owned, and I don't understand five of them. 
I immediately went to the last page, which happens to be page 1184. And I thought to myself, this book's really going to take some reading. To this date, I still haven't read it, but is it serves as a useful reference. I do, however, know what an eponymous term is, or eponym, and I understand what cited in parentheses means. So progress has indeed been made. The clumsy point that I'm trying to make here is the language of anatomy is complex and difficult to understand. Most of it is in Latin and Greek, and I barely studied English at school, let alone Latin and Greek. And in any journey towards expertise, you must expect life to throw you curveballs. That is just the way it is. And it did not stop me. My failures strengthened me, just as they will you. I still recall and often recount with those that I am privileged to teach the first muscle that I learned in anatomy. And it was a muscle in the neck that some of you may be familiar with. The muscle is called sternocleidomastoid a word containing 19 letters, and for most people, almost impossible to spell. I remember in my blissful ignorance of the day, thinking, who the hell came up with that as a word? And why make it so difficult? I decided to look up the etymology of the word, which simply means the origin or the root of the word, and learn that sterno simply referred to one of the Latin origins of the muscle, on the manubrium of the sternum. A good start, I thought. Cledo is a Greek word for little key and relates to another of the origins, this time on the clavicle. More progress. And finally, mastoid from the Latin relates to the mastoid process on the temporal bone, which is the muscle's insertion. To be honest, at that point, I fell in love. It all seemed to make so much sense origin, origin, insertion, or so I thought. The word sternocleidomastoid is a word made up of three words, two are Latin and the third is Greek. I then discovered that the proper name for this muscle is musculus sternocleidomastoideus. Now that has 27 letters. Now, obviously, musculus means relating to muscle. Or so you might think. It actually means rodent or small mouse. And this came about because of the philosophers of the time, like Plato, Galen and Hippocrates, and many others who were writing at the time, which was considered to be the period of medical enlightenment, were moving away from older concepts that were either religious or animistic, which simply means relating to animals. And they were moving more towards a scientific explanation. At the time of Galen, most philosophers believed that the bumps that appear when we contract muscles were small animals, such as rodents or small mice, that are running around inside the body, hence the name musculus. Strangely, the Latin name for the house mouse is mus musculus. The females amongst you might be interested to know that the same animistic views of the body considered that the uterus was an animal that roamed around the woman's body causing disease. Now, you can find out more by re reading Plato's view, on the wandering u uh, uh, Plato's view on the wandering uterus, should you be at all interested. You might also be interested to know that the word hysteria, hysterical, and even the surgical procedure called hysterectomy are all from these basic beliefs and concepts. To my horror, I discovered that the SCM also attaches to the superior neutral line on the occiput, and that unlike all anatomy books which describe this muscle as having two origins and one insertion, it has in fact two origins and two insertions. It has become apparent that the more I learn, the more I have to learn. I am sure by now you can see my problem. I am endlessly curious and I love to learn things about the world that I work in. Yes, I started wanting to find out about the origins of the word sternocleidomastoid, and I ended up studying a little about philosophy 
and the ideas behind Plato's view on the wandering uterus. Useless knowledge, perhaps, but I became just a little better read and a little more knowledgeable, something that I completely failed to do at school. For me, the time spent developing my knowledge and skills and understandings about massage was the best form of career insurance that time and money could buy. I wanted to be a successful massage therapist. Now, to be clear, I'm only 30 years into my career and I surpassed 50,000 hours of hands-on treatment experience a few years back, but I still know I have much to learn. Now, the observant amongst you might have noticed I have not spent much, spent much time on the financial benefits of being an expert. And there was a good reason for this. I am not that interested in money. For money, for me, money is a byproduct of what I do. Or as Peter Thompson would say, money is a silent applause of a job well done. I spend my time developing my skills and knowledge about my subject matter and that is massage. The reward for doing this was that lots of people wanted to come and pay me for my massage treatments. Over time, and to my absolute joy, people of influence or who were running or building businesses or other organizations also wanted to access my knowledge and skills to help or to influence their work. Most are paid for, but some are voluntary because I wanted to contribute or help bring about change. Such as in the case of the, of the misguided and poor information that has plagued the industry about massage for people with cancer. I am pleased to declare that I have not had a job or worked for the last 30 years. Now that is not to say that massage is not physically demanding because it is. But think about it this way. I get relatively well paid to spend time with people whose company I enjoy. Well, what sort of job is that? I can honestly tell you that I have made every one of my best friends in the last 30 years from the world of massage. I am immensely privileged to, to earn my entire living from the world of massage. And although I might still not consider myself to be an expert, there are many others that do. That is the financial and emotional benefit. That's all the financial and emotional benefit that I need to continue doing what I love. Now, I very much hope that I provided with you some, with some thoughts about becoming an expert in massage. Uh, do feel free to get in touch. Thank you. Hi, John. Hi. <laughs> that was so interesting. And I think what you're really, really talking about is the importance of critical thinking for anyone engaging in a massage profession. Yes. Um, so it, it, it's about, it is about a way of thinking uh, about what you want to do. For lots of people, I fear that massage is relatively boring and uninteresting. But for me, it's endlessly fascinating. Uh, absolutely endlessly fascinating. So, um, uh, and if you're interested in your subject matter, then you'll continue to study it. That's, I think that is absolutely and completely true. And it is about almost following that line of interest. If you follow the line of interest, you're always going to find something to engage with and that's something that really means something to you. I mean, I, lo I loved you talking, you know, about pulling apart the names and understanding the names. And I love your point about hysteria because funny enough, I was thinking only the other day, okay, if women are hysterical because they have a uterus, does that mean if you have a hysterectomy, you stop being hysterical because the uterus is no longer there? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, um, uh, yeah. I, mean, I think that's one of the beauties, isn't it? Um, my, you know, my story is absolutely true. I wanted to understand why somebody made a word so complicated. And when you do understand it, it's beautifully simple. Mm -hmm. 
and, and, and that was that was an eye opener for me. Um, um, but it also allowed me to get um, distracted when I was looking at things because I'd be fascinated about where the other things came from. And so I ended up studying a little bit about philosophy. Um, so, um, yeah, it, um, it, it is a way of thinking. It's a way of believing. And I, to be honest, I don't think that um, most of the therapists that I meet, and I know hundreds, if not thousands of them, they don't get close to understanding what opportunities and what amazing things that you can do with it. Some do, but most don't. Um, it's just a job to them. Uh, and for me, it's never been that, so. Mm. Well, what I'd love to know is what actually drove you towards massage, John, in the first place? So you said, I knew I would, that's what I wanted to do. What was the point at which you said, yes, I know that's where I want to go? Um, well, uh, previously to, um, to um, to actually going into the world of massage, um, um, I was um, I was a uh, I was running another business at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I've I've only um, I've only been employed by people for eighteen months since I left school, um, mm -hmm. uh, and I got fired twice and left once, um, uh, and I've never worked for anybody else since. Um, so. I bought my first business when I was 19 years of age, and I was a bit of a cheeky, cheeky chappy. Uh, and I managed to convince uh, a flour miller to help me buy a, uh, a very small backward facing business um, in, um, in Winslow. Uh, um, uh, and um, I needed to borrow five, five and a half thousand pounds in, I think this was 1970, seven, uh, 1976. Um, and uh, so that's about uh, 45,000 pound in today's money. Um, and I managed to convince a man called Paul Haygate to lend me that money. Um, um, and uh, I bought a little little backward facing business um, that had been a, a bakery for 300 years. And I set about teaching myself to become a baker. Um, and um, I had that business for 14 years. And had built it up to a turnover of around 1989. I think we had a turnover of 1.76 million, um, and um, uh, which is about 14 million in today's money. Um, uh, but I realised that um, we were too big to be small and too small to be big, um, and I'd probably reached the limits of my potential with it. Uh, you need different skill sets to run a business of that size, and I didn't have them, so I sold it. Um, but I was a regular recipient of massage uh, with a chap called Neil Slack. I used to go and see Neil every Thursday. Um, and um, um, you and I know from our previous conversations that uh, I have, um, beside my family, I have two loves in my life. And one, one is Harley Davidson motorcycles and the other one is, is fairly expensive cars. Um, and at the time, um, I bought my first Ferrari when I was 21. Um, so, wow. so, um, 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 and I managed to have a couple of them uh, in the end, but um, I'd rock up at Neil's house for a massage treatment because it's pretty stressful. We had nearly 100 staff at the time. And, um, you know, you, you, running a business of that side is, is demanding. There, um, our bakery operated for 162 hours a week. Um, and there are only 168 hours in a week. Um, so, so it was pretty busy. Um, 164 hours in a week um, and um, I, I used to go for massage once a week on a Thursday strangely enough uh, over to Neil and um, because I'm endlessly curious um, I, I, I remember talking to Neil thinking your life's magnificent your life is amazing you don't move outside your home people rock up here um, take their clothes off and you rub what looks like about 10 pence worth of oil on them charge them I think it was about 14 or 15 pounds. And then somebody else rocks up. Mm. I thought, that, you know, whereas I was funding a million pounds worth of equipment <laughs> so, um, and looking after a hundred staff. And I thought, my God, I, I'd love to do that. And uh, I remember, remember having a chat in Neil's uh, kitchen one day. And I said, do you know what? I'm going to sell the bakery business. And I'm going to go, I want to train to do what you do. And uh, he pointed out the window out into his courtyard where I used to park. And he said, come here for a second, John. And, um, uh, and he said, now look out the window. 
look at your car. And I'll say, I was, I was very lucky. I had a, a boy's dream car of a, a, of a, a 308 GTS Ferrari. Okay, with private plates on it, a typical boy. Okay, and it was parked next to his, and it was about a 30 year old beat up Volvo. And uh, he said, John, your car, my car, there's no money in massage. And I was arrogant enough and stupid enough to think, I bet there is, you just don't know how to make it. Mm -hmm. And for the last 30 years, Rosemary, I've trying to be, been trying to prove me right. Um, so <laughs> that's, that's how I got into it. Um, um, now, there is, there's very good money in massage. Um, um, but on the whole, it's self-limiting, mm. unless you do what I do. Yeah. Uh, I have multiple revenue streams from the world of massage. But fundamentally, I still work in a clinic. Um, you're seeing me in my clinic right now. Um, I work in here. I only do 24 hours a week, and I am fully booked. I don't have enough time to do more than that. Mm. But I still, I'm absolutely at the coalface on a day-to-day -day basis, and I love it. So that's it. Um, it just shines out of you that you know you absolutely love it. You you've you've found your niche. Yeah. That, so you know, I've been I've been immensely fortunate. But you know, to get me from where I was uh, and knowing diddly squat about anything to where I am now has taken a lot of time and effort and study. Um, but goodness me, if there was ever if there was ever a demand for really skillful experts in massage, it's right now. Um, I'm fortunate, I'm already there, but I'm towards the end of my career. I'm not at the beginning of it. Um, and, um, uh, but I'm still, I'm still valuable to other people to bring my knowledge and skills. And, and that's the bit I really enjoy sharing. So uh, my work with the massage company, with Cush, uh, the, the Standards Authority for Touching Cancer Care, um, it always benefits my clinic, which is where I am now, because the more I learn, the more valuable I become. Um, and, um, it, you know, what, a, what an amazing career. And I just wish that, um, uh, you know, uh, that uh, other therapists could understand the potential if you just get your thinking sorted. It's not about background. It's not about education. It's about willpower to want to succeed. And, and to prove yourself. And that's all I've got really, but nothing else. <laughs> yeah. I think what you just said, you know, the more I learn, the more valuable I become. Yeah. And I think in a way, this is partly what this whole day is about, is, is learning. Keep learning. Is yeah, I, I, I never, I never stop. Uh, you, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll hear a word that I've not heard before. Or when I'm talking to uh, people who sit on our board of advisors in Hydrothel, so we've got we've got lymphedema specialists, I've got nurses, I've got uh, chiropractors who advise me, um, and uh, when I'm chatting to them, quite often a word bounces into the conversation. I'm thinking, what does that mean? You know, rather than showing my education, uh, you know, my lack of education when I was a youngster, I write it down and then I go, then I go and learn it, and then I understand it. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, it can. Massage can provide the most incredible um, uh, living if you want it to. It's extremely well paid, um, you know, uh, and it is. Yeah, yeah, but, um, you know, lots of people aren't capable of being self-employed. They, they need to work for other people. Um, I'm not in that category. So I can only really talk about the people who want to work for themselves or do stuff themselves. Um, and, um, you know, part of part of my ambition in life is to share the things, uh, including the mistakes I've made, uh, is, uh, to, to share those things and say, don't do that because I, I did that and it's just going to blow up in your face, <laughs> you know, or do do this because this really works. And, and I think the more I share, um, um, then the more opportunities for other people to succeed there are. Um, uh, and um, I'm tried and tested. I've, I've jumped down every pothole and rabbit hole you can think of um, in terms of making mistakes so um, but you learn and it makes you stronger so um, uh, you know um, I perhaps could teach a few people how to avoid those mistakes <laughs> so. yeah but there's a book in there you know there's a book in there or at least there's a course uh, yeah. on, or at least there's a, there's a kind of a course on how not to make 
loads of mistakes in the massage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, I I, uh, I told another lady I was interviewed some time back, and I told another lady because she asked me what what the book is, and I said it's how to make money at massage, and it's probably not the way that most people think it is. Like, like, like most uh, stories, it, it, you need to understand some other things. <laughs> so, um, and when you understand those, then, you know, if you've got to be good at massage and you've got to really enjoy massage uh, and, and enjoy talking to people and stuff like that. But, I, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't worked for 30 years, Rosemary. Um, I've spent all my time doing what I love doing and getting fairly well paid for it. So, <laughs> so what sort of career is that, <laughs> you know? Um, so, um, yeah. Profit career, isn't it, Josh? <laughs> it's absolutely the perfect career. So I'm going to say thank you so much. If anyone's got um, questions for John, um, perhaps you can put them in the, the Facebook comments section and we can get them answered. And I'd really like to thank John for being so open, so honest, for saying, you know, hands like shovels are basically what you need. <laughs> and also, I think the other thing proving is is biomechanical efficiency, the fact that you're still working 24 hours a week and with all your body completely intact after however many years it is. Uh, I'm still doing it. I have no problems in my hands. Uh, that's mm -hmm. really because of the way that I work. I have no problems in my back. Um, and um, for, for me, it's been the perfect career, <laughs> so I've really enjoyed it. <laughs> so, okay. Wonderful. Thank you, John. Thank You're you. You're very so welcome. For coming. Lovely to see you. And you too. You too. Okay. Right. Take care. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. Okay, and so we will be back at 1.45 or about 15 minutes with Louise